Test, 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 test. Yeah, it's coming on. <coughs> Maybe just a little more. I'm having the sore throat issues. <coughs> All right, Philippians chapter 2. We're dealing with uh, the scriptures that relate to the kenosis of Christ. And uh, the primary beginning is in verse 5. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not a thing to be grasped after to be equal with God, but he emptied himself and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. <coughs> All right, I want to... Focus in on the last words of verse 7 and, um, um, and the first little phrase there in verse 8. <clears throat> it says, and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man. And the emphasis that I want you to see from that is <clears throat> that you can't really understand kenosis until you understand its relationship to man and its relationship to Jesus being man. And uh, so a fair amount of time will be spent in these classes dealing with this issue of Jesus being man. So if you would turn over to uh, Psalm, Psalm 8. And uh, last semester we went through the book of Psalms and we dealt with this psalm, <clears throat> but I want to address it again, not quite in the same manner. Psalm 8 and verse 1. Uh, we'll read verse 1, verse 3, and verse uh, 4. Verse 1. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. And then verse 3. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him? And we'll just hold it right there. And we'll ask the question, what is man to God? What is man to the Lord? What is the importance of this? <clears throat> And I, I will tell you that the understanding of what these scriptures are trying to bring out and the understanding of what Philippians is trying to bring out is um, more than just an issue that should bring to bear on your Christian life. <clears throat> it is an issue really and truly of every day. What to 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 discover what is man to God, what is man to the plan of God, and to understand his view, why he made man, why after all he did, and to discover that, to truly discover it by the Holy Spirit is to discover purpose for your life. It is to discover how to proceed every day. It is to discover what to do in crisis. It is to discover, um, <clears throat> you know, so many things. So I say all that, and that's great. That's good teaching. But what, what if I said to you, what if I just started calling names and asking each of you to tell me, what is man to God, and why is this important? Would you be able to formulate something that, would show that it has bearing on your life every day? Or would it just simply be, oh, God just decided he wanted to create mankind, and so he did, and that's that, and he's the boss, you know? So if I see you looking at me, I'm going to call on you. <laughs> <clears throat> Mike, give me a shot. What is man? What is man? Well, man is the one that God chose to orient himself to and, and fellowship with and I mean to be used in the midst of the created by and the son and to be his family. To take the life of his son and to make him 
man. Very good answer. <clears throat> Amen. Mike Wallace knows how to share the word of God. <clears throat> uh, and you wonder why I tease him so much over the years when he's so spiritual. <laughs> <laughs> Well, basically, if, if we didn't get that on the the recording, he said that 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 it was uh, man is the one that God chose to be joined to, that uh, they would become one, that um, would be his bride, his family, his body, if you will, all the way around. <clears throat> um, and of course, with that answer, you will find reason to live and, and means and, and whatever. Does anybody else have a further explanation of why, what is man to God and what is man to this whole thing? Yeah, Shay? Man is the image of God in the physical manifestation of all that is true or should be or would be um, the physical manifestation of all that is true of God. It's like spirit put into a different it's like all that is true of God in the spirit put into a different medium if you will to show forth his glory and his ways and, and to testify of him um, but that he would like he was saying in, in addition to in that then him having communion with that and him filling that with his life and being that but it is a physical manifestation it's a different realms manifestation of God Amen. And uh, relates, that relates to manifesting him or manifesting his glory, his image. Yes. I think something the psalmate talks about man being given dominion, uh, that God's put all things under his feet. Yes. And um, something of that dominion speaks of a free will to operate with him <clears throat> in, a, in a relationship of uh, agreement or love. Or, you know, there's a choice to partake of his dominion and to give him place or to, to be filled with yourself. And um, man has that, you know, angels have free will, but they don't have the option to be filled with Christ. Whereas man is the only creature, though he be lower than the angels, that has the option to be filled with the Son. Give dominion back to yeah. the earth. Good. Yeah. Right. And we'll be, we'll be hitting on all of that, <clears throat> some of it even in this class right here. Um, let me just ask you this question. Do you think that when God created man, that basically when you looked at man as God created him in that perfect environment, do you think that, that you could see the full purpose and plan of God in that man? No. Anybody? Yes. No. Okay, and, and why would you say no? say uh, yes to the question because um, of all the things that God created on this earth we're the only thing that he created to ascend back into the heavens and that Amen. was a purpose from the beginning Amen well in that sense I have to agree with both of you because you know um, when he created man it was above all the creatures and even the very scriptures we read here when I consider the heavens and work by things what is man that thou art mindful of him? <clears throat> because man seems so small, and yet man is the crown of his creation. Um, but then you also take into consideration that God really is a God of progression, and that's seen right off. In the beginning, God created, and on day one, he did this, and day two, he did this, and day three, he did that. And it all wasn't just done instantaneously, which, which sort of just... <coughs> From our, our <coughs> here, it sort of refutes the Big Bang Theory in the sense that if God created everything, he's not a Big Bang God. You the know, Big Bang Theory has been totally refuted. Well, 
<laughs> no, they, it was an echo. No, it wasn't actually. They, the sound they thought it was was they discovered that it was an echo from something else, and so there's never been a real big bang recorded like they, like they said they did. So. Well, and again, the scriptures to me and the, the, the proof of the way God is also disproves that because He is a God of progression, and um, and so and, and it's can I say that it's a wise progression? I usually say this when I'm sharing upon this point that He didn't He didn't create man on the first day and like on the sixth day create water or something, you know what I mean? <laughs> and food, you know He He progressively brings things more and more and more to the proper place. And um, and then we see that with us, uh, in Christianity. As um, soon as we get saved, the Big Bang Theory would make us all just perfect. Mm -hmm. yeah, everything would just be perfect. But in reality, uh, we see among Christians, churches, there are actually still problems. And that God is yet working in our lives. He's not done with us yet. There's a work to be done. And so, uh, but, but, you know, let's, let's go to Genesis there. And let's, let's begin to examine this because it'll be, it'll be more important later on that we see some of these things. But in Genesis chapter 1, um, Verse 26. Genesis 1 and verse 26. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowls of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. <coughs> so God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowls of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. <clears throat> um, and we'll stop right there. And so we see that the, the first word spoken about man is let us. I mean, you notice it didn't say let I. <laughs> let me. But let us make man in our own image, and uh, and after our likeness. But let's consider that for a moment. Is the image of God, if man being made in that image, is he perfect when he's created? Anybody want to comment on it? Define perfect. Well, that's that's what I want to hear here. I want to because <coughs> just like what we got. Uh, a yes and a no, and then since they both were right, I think we might be able to do the same thing here in one, in one sense. Kevin? Well, I was thinking of perfect being mature, you know, and, and so man was not mature at the very beginning because otherwise he wouldn't have fallen. Right. Um, so he hadn't gotten to that. First of all, I'd like to say thank you very much and congratulations because uh, Clearly, your mind has been conformed to what the scriptures describe as the word perfect and yes. not what the world describes as perfect. And that's a hard leap for most people to make because when it says be you perfect, that means don't ever make a mistake. That's what they say. That's not what you're saying. And I, I appreciate that. Yes. Scott? Well, in the sense that um, man was an empty vessel ready to be filled up, I think he was perfect sense of being ready to be become what God uh, You could say he was perfectly prepared. Perfectly yeah. primed. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. You know, he, he, he didn't have the knowledge of good and evil at that point in time. Right. And there wasn't that the separation. Life. Or no the tree of life. And there wasn't that separation. That's right. Okay, so I guess the angle that I was coming from is, you know, it is the the world's version of perfect. And if he was perfect, he would not have sinned. Perfect people don't sin. You understand what I'm saying? If you're perfect, you don't sin. 
And, uh, but he wasn't made perfect in the sense that he will never fail or he will never do wrong or he will never get off. He was made in a certain way, and we've hit on it several times, he was, he was made as a perfect vessel, but he was not yet fully containing what it was that God had in mind. Okay? So, uh, and there's this aspect also that God said to him, uh, and apparently God, the, the determinant counsel of God, let us make man. Meaning there's a determinant counsel within that. You see what I'm saying? There's, when us gets together and decides to do something, there had to be somewhat of a determinant counsel. Is it the and Trinity? Pardon? Is it, is it mentioning that as, it, as the Trinity? Yes, absolutely. And so uh, representing the Trinity there, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Um, and apparently there was an image and likeness that reflects God, but it is not God, because God is perfect. Mm -hmm. And, and you'd, you could say it like this, God is perfect, because if God ever sinned, he would no longer be God. He would be something way short of that, you know. And so... Uh, uh, there, but there is this image that he made man in that he was satisfied with when he created him in that form. And I think this falls back on what Scott was saying, that there was this, this preparation, this prepared vessel for what God had in mind and that creation and, and then, of course, and, you know, there's still, a, you got to remember this, even if he was perfect, he still... There was still a shortage in his life. What was that? Well, are you talking about Eve or are you talking about the, the tree uh, of life? Uh, well, both. Both of them. There was a shortage in terms of uh, what Shea said, Eve and the tree of life. God said it's not good for man to be alone. Now remember, man, it's not good for man to be alone. And yet at his creation, he did not have a counterpart. Do you see that? So... So while it is good, all is not fully set in God's order yet, okay? And then I won't go into the full story of the, the creation or the, the making of Eve out from his rib, not from the dust of the earth, but all of that speaking of uh, what happened apart from sin, that he was put to sleep, his side was open. Part of him was taken out and from that formed a bride that was him, bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. And that's, those are the scriptures we read in Ephesians that talk about the bride. And so just on that front, uh, and well, let me finish this before I call on a couple of people. So God created them in his own image. In the, light, in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And so the him is really a them. Do you understand? Yep. And, and so in, you can say that he was perfect in, in what he was made at that moment, but he was not perfected until the tree of the knowledge of good, or tree of life, sorry, until the tree of life, which never happened, and until the bride was brought forth. Uh, through him. So, uh, so, did you have a comment? Yeah, I just wanted to say maybe a real succinct way of saying it is that, that Adam was unspoiled hmm. yet incomplete. Very good. He was unspoiled yet incomplete. Carolyn, did you have a comment? Well, Ali, could you like, make an analogy that uh, man is to God the way the moon is to the sun, that it reflects, <coughs> but without the sun, the moon can't reflect. Right. Well, with that man, it's supposed to reflect right. God, but without God, you can't. There's no there's, there's true no, reflection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, I was, I was just thinking uh, another analogy. I mean, this is what I was thinking about when you were talking earlier was how you, know, you can have a potter and he can make a he can make a vessel. You know, let's say a coffee cup or something, and that coffee cup may be perfect in the sense that it's you know. It's a coffee cup, but until it's filled up with coffee and being drunk from, it's not really not fulfilling. Yeah, it's perfect. And so the 
he was talking about a potter making a vessel and then yet never drinking, you know, whatever it was that it, its purpose was for. Um, therefore, even if you made it, if it, if it hasn't been filled with the proper contents, it has failed its purpose and its calling. Um, uh, you know, it's interesting, but back, back in those days, they didn't really make vessels for uh, luxury or for... Uh, to look at. What, yeah, to look at what is a better Aesthetics. Way. Decorative. Decorative, yeah. They didn't make decorative things, you know, particularly in Israel and in that land. You know, everything was made to serve a purpose. And uh, so there were no, you know, people didn't make beautiful pottery and set it up and go, oh, let's just look at that, you know. Which really, if you think about it, would be a real perversion. Because it would be, it would be like uh, you being the vessel of Christ and Christ being in you but everybody's simply admiring you and not seeing Jesus. Or Jesus isn't even in you and they're just admiring you and you might represent him. But it is you that they see and you that they admire. It'd be like, you know, I mean, say Mary, you know, the mother of Jesus who's the, the vessel that brought forth Christ being lifted up, you know, as high or higher than Jesus himself. That'd be crazy or something like that. <laughs> well, anyway. Uh, <clears throat> And so, you know, because she was just the vessel that brought him forth. And, uh, and you know, to make, him, make her any higher is you're going to have to create doctrines apart from the word. You're going to have to come up with the immaculate conception, which applies to Mary, not Jesus. And, um, you know, say that she was born without sin also. Well, I don't really see the necessity of that, but nonetheless... Uh, that's, that's where we go with that. And all of this, honestly, all of this comes out and can be created. All these false doctrines come out and can be con created simply because we do not understand the basic plan of God and what yeah. was in his heart. We've been taught by somebody what that was. And you know what? We sit right mm -hmm. here in this class, and you can be taught by somebody yes. what that is. And all you're doing is being taught by somebody, just like if somebody was teaching something wrong. It's That's still wrong. Yes. The deal is, is that we must individually get in the Word. We must challenge what you're being taught. Um, I, remember, uh, I remember when I was in Bible school, uh, you know, I had a lot of questions. When I was in Bible school, they would say something, and I'd go, wait a minute, hold it. You know? And I, I'm sure I was annoyed. Okay, I'm going to, you know, Deb was there. I'm sure I was annoyed. Because I'm going, now, I don't really, you know. But I was asking because my mind was yet carnal. I had not seen Jesus. I was a Christian, but I hadn't seen the Lord. And... So they would say things from the mind of Christ, which I'd never walked around in there. You know what I mean? I didn't. I've never explored in the mind of Christ. You know, I got my own mind, and they'd say something. I go, oh, you know. I mean, I remember literally feeling like kind of you know, trying to, what, what, you know? And and I thank God that I questioned stuff. And some I didn't just go, you know, you're stupid teacher. I didn't do that. You know, but I mean, you know, I, I would question because I wanted an answer because I believed if they had an answer, they ought to be able to tell me, you know. And, uh, and at other times, I had questions, but I didn't take it to them. I took it to the Lord. And I said, Lord, and I, you know, I still do that to this day. I still hear things that I kind of go, well, that ain't right, you know. Uh, from men who know way more than I do. And I still kind of go, well, that ain't right. But if, if, I, if I know everything, I have the right to say, that ain't right. Mm -hmm. But if I don't yet know everything, I don't really have a right to go, that ain't right. I have the right to go to the Word and to wait on the Lord and spend a good amount of time waiting to trust Him to communicate the truth to my heart so that I'm not walking in that man's teaching. I'm walking in my Father's word to my heart. And, and contrary to popular belief about me, 
I want every one of you to know the Lord on your own for yourself and to walk in the land, land of the living and the light of the Lord. And uh, that's my deepest desire. That is my furthest desire, that every one of you would be free eventually from every string attached to not just this place and me, but anyone else so that you can stand up on your own two feet walking the Lord and, and know, you know, Paul said, you know, we need to know what it is that we believe, you know, not just believe certain things. We need to know why we believe those things and, and stuff. So, um, anyway, so God, God creates man in his own image, but then he does something completely different that he didn't do with animals or, or anything else. He gave man dominion. He gave man dominion in the earth. Now, okay. God created, you know, on the first day he created this universe and all this stuff and then, you know, plants and everything. But there's, there's uh, outside of this planet, outside of this solar system, this vast, you know, and we're just using that as an example. If you really knew how vast it was, you would go, oh my God, he's got a lot of dominion and he gave us just a little. <laughs> you know, I'm using that as an example. Very poor picture, but it'll, it'll help to, to at least wrap your mind around it a little bit. But he did give man, mankind. When I say man, I'm talking about mankind. I'm not talking about the male sex. You know, man. He gave mankind the money, okay? And um, uh, that was an impartation of something that he didn't have to give. Something that, we'll see here shortly, something that ended up costing God, if you will, because he gave man dominion and man didn't control it very well. You understand what I'm saying? And so God said, okay, I give you dominion over the earth. And, you know, uh, uh, here, mankind now in, in an innocent state, because that's the way I always put it. Man was created innocent, but he wasn't created perfect. Right. You know, at that moment, he was innocent. But he wasn't perfect because if he was perfect, he just stayed mm -hmm. you know, innocent. <clears throat> um, so here, dominion is given. and um, but, but then we see the world in, a, in total turmoil now. And you begin to discover that from chapter 3 over here, Genesis 3. Um, verse 1, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said. And there you have it. You know, the devil still questions God. Now, where does he question God at? I mean, if a tree falls in the forest, does it make a sound? Is that, is that how that goes? Mm -hmm. More or less. Yeah. It doesn't make any because it's nobody knows it. Okay. Uh, well, that's I don't believe that's true because sound waves are made by certain things happen. You know, whether you're there or not doesn't make it true. It's true whether you're there or not. I don't think that, that Satan uh, just questions God like this. Nobody around him. No demons around him. Well, I don't think that's right. You know, I don't think he's, I don't think his question is just running in his head. And, well, I don't think that's right. Well, I don't, you know, I don't know that things should be this way. Well, why isn't it out? You know, all the questioning going on. I think he questions God to us. Yes. Amen. Okay. Now, you know, apparently the serpent in the garden, you know, nowadays we go, oh, the snake. You know, right? I mean, a lot of people really don't like snakes. You know, I, I remember, um, um, I'm trying to remember the guy's name, Paul Harvey. Paul Harvey was talking on the radio once, and he said this guy did this little experiment. And what he did was he got out in the country, and he got this rubber turtle and a rubber snake. 
and he put the and he got, he went and he put the rubber turtle out in the road, and then he went and hid, and then he watched to see what would happen. And cars would be coming down the road real fast, and they would see that rubber turtle. They didn't know it was rubber. They thought it was real. And they would swerve out of the way, or they would make sure that they went over it so they didn't run over it or everything else. And, and uh, so much so that one time somebody got out of the car to set him, you know, and he says, well, I came out of the way. I'm sorry. I'm doing an experiment. It's rubber. It's not real, so you don't have to save his life. And so then, after he finished that, he put a rubber snake out there. And he said people would come down the road and they'd see that thing and they'd speed up and just before they'd get to it, they'd slam on their brakes to slide over it to scrape it and kill it and, you know, do all this stuff, you know, <laughs> swerving, almost dying, you know, trying to kill it. You know, the other people were swerving, dying to, to say, well, what is the explanation of some that sort of reaction? Well, I don't know, but I don't think Adam and Eve were born with that because Eve didn't seem bugged at all. <laughs> Besides, it says upon your, you know, upon your belly you shall go. So some people say that the serpent originally had feet or something, but God defeated it. <laughs> <laughs> Only Mallory doesn't laugh because she, she's heard it so many times. So, so sad thing, so is Mike. <laughs> of, of uh, his nature or his, even, even if, if I've had some people say, well, you know, that image was spirit, soul, and body, that man was made spirit, soul, and body, but if he died spiritually, he's not in the image of God anymore because he doesn't reflect, let us make man, there's not the us of that there. So, however you want to go about it, I don't, it really doesn't matter, the Bible says that man fell and with that, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and, and all of this basically because of the subtlety of the enemy, the sneakiness of the enemy, um, and causing man to sin. <clears throat> now, there's the question of, uh, well, let me, let me give you one more scripture before I make that statement. Uh, look in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I will start in verse 3. 2 Corinthians 4 3. You ready? Mm -hmm. But if our gospel be hidden, it is hidden to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world, or in some translations, the God of this age, hath blinded the minds of them who believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine into them. That's 2 Corinthians 4 4. Um, and so uh, the scriptures declare that he is the God of this world or the God of this age. Now, there are several different ways of looking at that. You can say, well, he is the God of this world, this planet. But in reality, he's not the God of this earth. The earth is the Lord's Amen. and the fullness thereof. But he is the God of this age or this, this world System is even a better way of putting it. Okay? Not just a, because age makes you think of a certain period of time. He's the God of this certain period of time. But in reality, world represents a world system. And that world system, uh, again, now let me make a division here. Uh, on one hand, you can say that here is the globe. And here is the devil. I guess he was more like a rabbit. And he controls, you know, he controls that this is his 
possession now. He has dominion. He stole or he tricked Adam out of that dominion. That's one way that you can put it. But there's also another way that you can put it, and that is that on this globe, there are men, and their hearts are controlled by the enemy. Their spirit, their nature is now controlled by the enemy. They are now motivated by greed and missing my billfold. And I, I am missing my billfold. See, like, every time I get up in front of you now, something is wrong somewhere. <laughs> But anyway, uh, and, and uh, that he doesn't, it's not like this globe is his. You understand what I'm saying? The God of this world, uh, the, the Bible says the prince of the, pow prince of, the power of the air. Um, but rather now he has control of men in the sense that he knows what motivates them. He knows that what the dangle, the carrot to dangle in front of them to cause them, to motivate them. And he knows that they will be motivated by covetousness. They will be, all of this being self. Right. Covetousness. Uh, uh, greed. Honor, honor. Lust. Power. Lust. Lust. All of those things. And so the the ball called the earth is the Lord's. But many of the people aren't. Got it? <laughs> Does that make sense? That many, you know, and that he basically is the God of this world. Or the God, you know, you, in a sense, in one sense you could say he's the God of this earth because he's the God of this system that's working in most of the people on the earth. Do you see what I'm saying? It's uh, the most important part of that statement is he is the God of the system that works in the sons of disobedience, which Paul talks about that in Ephesians chapter 1 and chapter 2. Um, so, while it's not like a scroll that God gave to man and he says, I give you dominion, and man gets tricked by the devil and hands that scroll to the devil and says, I now have dominion of the earth. You see what I'm saying? I believe that man still has dominion. The problem is the devil has dominion over man. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes. The devil has dominion over them, and therefore, and therefore, basically he's got the dominion over the earth because he's got the dominion over the people who have dominion over the earth. Yeah. Okay? A rather long way go around, but I mean, it's, I think these things are important. I remember when I was taught this, I was taught this method right over here, that, that God, the, the, the devil was the, uh, the God of this world, and that he owned it now. Uh, remember when Jesus came, and uh, he was baptized, and then he went out into the wilderness, and the devil tempted him, you remember that one? And he took him up upon a high mountain and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and he said, I will give you this if you will bow down and worship me. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, number one, that wouldn't, you know, remember these are the temptations of Christ. Amen? Remember? That's when the devil tempted Jesus. That wouldn't be a temptation if he didn't own that. Yeah. Right? Jesus would go, you don't own that. That ain't no temptation. I ain't falling for that. But Jesus didn't approach it like that at all. You see what I'm saying? Because those kingdoms <coughs> were his kingdom. And yet, in this sense, and you have to remember, the word kingdom really relates to government. And when you get down to the clearest kind of government, we're not talking about somebody sitting on the throne or somebody sitting in the Oval Office. We're talking about what motivates you, what governs you, what makes you tick. Okay. Mm -hmm. And if it's self, yeah. I don't care if you're born again or not, you're, you're, the system that operates in you is no different than the people of the world. The goal is not to become Christian. The goal is to let Christ rule in you, which is the kingdom of God. Yes, okay. Because somebody says, well, where, you know, where is the kingdom of God? Anywhere Christ rules. 
Hmm. So it's that simple. That's not difficult. That's 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 real easy math right there. Where's the kingdom of God? Anywhere Christ rules. Was the kingdom of God here? Well, hopefully. <laughs> you know, hopefully he is in me, if nothing else. But you know, you know what I'm saying. I mean, hopefully he's here and he's ruling uh, in me, but he should be ruling in us. But let's face it, a whole lot of people that go to church, man, they get greedy. They want this. They want that. They want their way. All of these things come up in them because they are ungoverned or rather governed by the wrong thing. They, are tr they truly are governed. Sure. Yeah. They're just governed by the wrong thing. Now, it reminds me of that verse in Revelation that says the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Satan really did have those kingdoms in hand because he yes. you know, could be, our susceptible could be tempted to do so. And it just would bring some other meaning to that verse. That God is conquering those kingdoms and they are becoming his. Right. Uh, very, very well said. She, she was uh, talking about the scripture in Revelation that says the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign. Uh, meaning he is the governor of the government. He's seated on the throne of our heart. He is seated as the governor of our being. I mean, that's why, you know, we, we're all, you know, a bunch of people say, oh, I want Jesus to come back. I want the thousand year reign. I want him to rule and reign on the earth. Well, folks, you can start that right now. You can let him rule and reign in you. And we can try to spread that. <laughs> you know, I mean, that would be a good idea. Oh, we can just wait. Do you see something? You know? Look, up in the sky. It's a bird. No, it's... <laughs> And so, but, but uh, what Mallory is saying is that scripture says the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. <laughs> Instead of taking that as some sort of end time thing, folks, that's saying this is the way to, to affect the world is to change people's governments. <laughs> the governments that work in people. And I won't go into it, but again, Dealing in when I dealt in the book of Daniel, if you remember, there was a beast, but the beast had what was it, seven heads, and all the heads were different. You know, one looked like this, one that, and that, and and uh, and it was showing the different kingdoms that were going to come in the earth. Well, folks, they were all the same beast. I mean, one one kingdom can be uh, 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 covetous. Another one can be this, and another one be that, but they're all out from the same body, the same core, yes. you see. And, but we get all caught up in the beast. We say, well, I like this, you know. Maybe, you know, what if we were like, we were covetous, and we didn't like the, the beast that's ruling right now, the head that is ruling right now, you know, Greece or Rome or, you know, you go right down. They were all just examples of different things that they emphasize, you know. Greece was, was wisdom, the wisdom of man, and all this kind of stuff. Rome was power, you know. Well, I don't like all this mental intellect, man. I just, you know, you know. Well, are you sure you're not just the Roman head of this beast? Is that not just still him? And we, you know, we say, well, it's all different, and I don't like this, so I want to, you know. <clears throat> well, the goal is Christ, period. The goal is he must increase and I must decrease. It's that simple. It's just that simple. And so, um, so you begin to see this reality, though, that after Adam fell, the enemy began to take over. And then their kids got Cain and Abel. And immediately, you know, uh, uh, with time, Cain rises up and kills Abel, who offered an acceptable sacrifice. Okay? Why? Because after the fall, God said to the serpent, her seed, which means man, is going to come and he's going to crush your head. Okay. Well, now the enemy hears that. The devil hears that and he goes, oh man, I gotta be on the lookout. So, you know, the first two people that show up after the fall is Cain and Abel. 
And Cain, you know, starts going the way of the enemy. But Abel is going the way of God. So, you know, the devil goes, it's, there he is. He points at Abel and says, there's that seed that he said, he's going to try to kill me and crush my head. Well, that ain't going to happen. I'm going to kill him first. So he insights came to kill that seed, thinking that that's the promised seed that he was, you know, supposed to be. And boom, you know. Now we begin the process of to end up. And, you know, everybody looks at me funny, you know, when I talk about uh, persecution and, 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 and the lamb and all this kind of stuff. We're talking about the heart of it right now. From history beginning from in the word of God, Cain and Abel all the way through, the enemy always rose up. And you never see God rising up in the sense of just, you know, I said, well, we'll just control everything and whatever. Ultimately, it is the, the fear and the dread the enemy has in his heart pertaining to the seed that will come in man. And you can play church all day long, and he's not afraid of that. Do you understand what I'm saying? You can, you can pray, and you can read your Bible, and you can do all kinds of things, and if, if the enemy doesn't perceive the seed there, he don't care. Go ahead, do it. Moralize the world. <laughs> you know, just keep on doing it because you're no threat to him. But if Christ starts being formed in people, Thing within him, he starts marshalling his forces. You know, have you ever thought, have you ever thought, well, you know, gosh, I'm nobody. Why would the enemy spend so much energy attacking me? Has anybody ever thought that before? Thought, you know, I, gosh, I'm really not much of a threat here. Or, or your church that you were involved with, did you ever think, well, you know, my God, we are a drop in the bucket. We are spit on the ground. We are nothing. Why is he so upset? Because he fears that seed coming forth in man in this earth and it scares him to death because it's the only thing that will stop his government, his kingdom. In man, his kingdom, the devil's kingdom. It's the only thing that can reverse, as Jim says, the forces. <laughs> it's the only thing that can reverse the forces. <laughs> and And... Of course, that is a total defeat if his kingdom comes in us by his life. Because then the enemy is no longer, the puppet master's strings have been cut. That's right. Do you see what I'm saying? He, 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 you know, he can't pull your strings and he can't make you do it and he can't still have dominion. Because then, if the old man is dead, well, that's how he always got his way. That's how he motivated people and made them do his bidding. But if the old man is dead and Christ is your life, he can't motivate Christ to do anything but live for God. Amen. Scares him to death, man. So, you know, uh, let's go to Isaiah uh, 59. And uh, we'll probably finish just with this scripture. Uh, pick it up. You know, it's so funny. But uh, uh, my computer went down a couple of days ago. <clears throat> Everything I had on it. You know, a life worth of work and stuff like that. And, uh, but it was barely hanging on enough where I could slowly pull stuff off with the hope that within days of pulling and working, and I will save much of it, you know. So that's what I've been doing for about the last three days. It's just, it's just the computer problems are almost as bad as car problems, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, just doing that. And so today, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm on the last leg of my journey of trying to get the, everything that you can get off. You know, there's programs and stuff. That's it. You don't have a backup or something. And uh, so I'm doing that, and I'm thinking about class, and I'm thinking, oh, Lord, you know, but thank God I've got, like, big, thick notes on this, you know, from years of study and everything. So uh, just so I, so I wait till the last minute, Deb calls, says, got to meet us for dinner, da da da, da. so I grab my Bible, and 
go out and I get there a few minutes early and I get in the car and I open my Bible and I start flipping through for my notes and they're not in there. And I'm thinking, two hours of classes here. <laughs> and, but then I remembered, I know this stuff. <laughs> This is, this is what motivates me. This is, this is my eyes. This is how I see. This is what I understand to be the truth and why I make a stand for the Lord every day. And so I took some time to just jot down the scriptures, and that's basically all that is. It's just scripture after scripture, you know. Because this reality, if, I mean, if you could imagine this reality grabbing the heart of every Christian and realizing what this whole thing really is about, you wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't be impressed with big anymore or exciting. Right. Or they would yeah. be impressed with Christ alone, knowing only Christ is going to make a difference in my God. Let's live for him and let's, let's do all we can to get him not only formed in us, formed in this body, but reach out as far yes. as we can do that mm -hmm. because it is the plan of God and it is the heart of God. Amen. You know, so that, that, that keeps you going when buffeted and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, I just thought it was funny that, you know, it's almost like, you know, for a moment there, oh my God, I don't have any of my notes here. What am I going to teach? And I'm like, teach the word. <laughs> <laughs> teach what I know to be true in Christ. <laughs> Okay, last scripture for now. Um, uh, Psalm 59. Psalm. I'm sorry, Isaiah. Isaiah 59. You were in the right place. Thank you very much for your keeping me on track. Verse 16. Uh, let's see. There's probably a... Uh, yeah, we need to go back from that. Uh, <laughs> okay, let's start at verse 12. <clears throat> For our transgressions are multiplied before thee, and our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us, and as for our iniquities, we know them. In transgressing and lying against the Lord, and departing from our God, speaking oppression and revolt and conceiving and uttering from the heart words of falsehood or lies, and justice is turned away backwards, and righteousness stands afar off, for truth is fallen in the street. And equity cannot enter. Yea, truth faileth, and he that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey. Mm -hmm. And the Lord saw it, and that this pleased him that there was no justice. And verse 16, and he saw that there was no man, and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore his arm brought salvation unto him, and his righteousness sustained him. Let me make this clear. The intercessor here is not someone who prays. He's looking for a man. He's looking for a man that his government will be in. You understand? He gave dominion to man, and, 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 and he gave that to man, and he's not an Indian giver. He's not going to take that back. He's not going to give it and then say, well, you blew it. You messed up. You got with the devil, so I take it back. He doesn't do that. He gave it to man, so if not, and when he looks and he sees all of these horrible things going on, and he just marvels, there is no intercession, there is no one to stand in, you know, he saw that there was no man. And he said, okay, then I'll, I'll make a man, I'll send a man, I'll bring forth. Uh, uh, his arm brought salvation unto him, and his righteousness sustained him. So he sent Jesus, he said, you'll be the man. You'll be the man, you'll be the the true man. You'll be the, the exact image of what I had in mind for man. And that's what we want to start trying to explain coming up here in our next session. Um, but you have to see that when all of this, this took place, every man was had a nature of sin. Every one of them was motivated by self. And even if, even if there were you know, they were quote unquote men of God or whatever. Uh, they still had wrong motivations. I mean, uh, you know, you got murder running rapid. I mean, Moses killed the Egyptian and David killed Uriah and on and on. You got all this stuff from the very best stuff, okay? And God looks and he goes, and it doesn't say he wonders that, you know, everybody's sinning. 
He's just saying, I need a man. I created man, and I need a man, mankind. I need someone who will represent me in the manner that I originally created man to represent me. And that's where we'll get into next. We dismiss from that.